Good morning, people. Well, if you don't know it, you are on the Eric Epperly Designs channel. This is my channel where I post things that I design. As a multifaceted designer, I do graphic design, you know, logos, banners, uh, print ads, web ads, stuff like that. I also do website design. I also have a heavy background in software development and programming with a focus on web design. Um, what else? <laughs> I love designing in my spare time. I like taking uh, palettes apart and building palette projects, and I hope to post some of those if I make a, 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 a slideshow video or something, figure out how that is. I'm very technical, but I haven't had time to figure out everything. So this is where we are today. If you've seen any of my other channels, you'll notice that I'm a very spiritual individual, yet logical and analytical at the same time. So I have multiple, multiple facets to me. In addition to my art, I have a spiritual a channel that's called Light Wolf Shamanic Healing and in that channel this morning I made another video and I'm using wearing the same shirt. So if you see them and you're like, hey, yep, yeah, that's me. Same channel. So without further ado, let's get to uh, the purpose of this video. So this is episode one and I'm starting a new series on this channel. As you, let me tell a little bit about, uh, a little bit about it. You know, the date is uh, uh, November 25th, 2020. We're almost at the end of the year 2020. And as you may, may know, um, if you've seen any of my stuff on Facebook or YouTube in the past, I'm a writer as well as a graphic artist and a musician and, you know, just anything that's creative is pretty much something that I do. Uh, and I've had a book in the works since 2016 called Confessions of a Talented and Gifted Dropout. God gave me the title, the Holy Spirit showed it to me, and I was like, yes, that's perfect. Why Confessions of a Talented and Gifted Dropout? I don't know. I, I think I heard some title of another book called Confessions of Something. And through, um, I, I love books, and I, I came across, after I already came up with this title, here's a side little tidbit, I found out there's a book from that... Who wrote it? Somebody named Corey Alanis wrote a book called Confessions of an Opium Eater. And I believe that that was in like the 1800s or maybe even the 1700s. And that was something that book basically was a uh, the, the title was a model for other people to copy. So Confessions of a fill in the blank. Right. So somewhere along the line, somebody did confessions of something, and I had heard it, and it stuck in my mind a little bit, and I was like, okay, well, let me see. I, I should do confessions of a talented and gifted dropout. Why a talented and gifted dropout? Because I've been, always been a, a talented uh, and gifted individual ever since I was a little kid. I was born that way. I used to make collages True story. I used to make collages from porn magazines when I was five. I didn't grow up in the best environment, but there you have it. And um, very, I was very creative with materials that I ended up using to stick it to the paper and the poster board. But that's that's a, another story for another time. Um, when I was seven, I used to make little mini, what they ended up calling zines at one point but they didn't even have a name for it at that time. I made like a little six page booklet by just folding um, paper, uh, standard eight and a half by 11 letter size paper, folding the typing paper in half and then drawing cartoon characters on it. I remember I drew Scooby-Doo and I drew Pac-Man. This was in the 80s, like 84-ish, maybe 80, 82, somewhere between 82 and 84. I drew E.T. and I was drawing these characters and I would even go so far as to put a, what do you call it, a, a crossword puzzle. I'd make my own crossword puzzles at age seven and put them in, in these books. Well, not blaming anybody, but I grew up in the ghetto <laughs> with people who weren't exactly talented or gifted and didn't even graduate college. I mean, didn't go to college at all. 
and barely graduated high school. So I didn't have the most, what would you say, the most conducive environment growing up to, to being ushered into, I don't know, celebrity and stardom that maybe other talented and gifted kids did. That's all I got to say about that. I'm not a victim. That's just the story of my experience. So there was a program that they offered when I was in was a fourth, fifth, or sixth grade. I think it was sixth grade called Talented and Gifted at the junior high. And it was for kids like me who always finished the math ahead of everybody else in class, always finished the language arts and the reading and got super high on the, the Iowa test of basic skills. Um, and they decided, hey, Eric, we think you fit in this class. And they had a class and it was just one class and they called it Talented and Gifted. And basically, you got to replace certain periods of the day I guess instead of going to homeroom, you'd go to a talented and gifted homeroom where they'd teach you college level vocabulary. I remember one of the words that they taught was cornucopia, and I was like, I already know that word. You know, it kind of felt like I already know a lot of this stuff. What what are they trying what's going on here? Because I didn't know anything about it. Nobody in you know, it wasn't something that was announced, hey, here's something, get your kids signed up. No, the school administrators just decided that that's where I belonged. And strangely enough, at the same time, they had me in the resource room, which also, you know, I know this is going to offend some people, but so what? Suck it up. This is, uh, they called it the retard room because that's how people, that's how people are mean sometimes. Um, so I had to go to the retard room all the time, even though I was a genius. So... I thought that was an interesting dichotomy at that age, but I made some good friends there. And what I later discovered was it wasn't the retard room. It was the retard, the behavioral retardation, the, the slow social uh, skills growth group for the most part. People who didn't understand popularity and socializing and, and getting along either get along getting along with others or the need to or didn't what am I trying to say there were people in there that didn't get along with others that were just disagreeable and unagreeable and had anger management issues and this kind of stuff but then there were also people like me who who got along with people just fine just didn't feel the need to surround myself with a circle of people I was fine just by myself so anyway that's a, we can elaborate that on it at a different time but so I remember that and I remember another period we got to skip and it was close to lunch so we got to eat our lunch in the in the room and I don't it wasn't very well structured let me put it that way I think what they were trying to do was something like what's known as a Montessori school combined with um, kind of the, the self-directed education or a lot of the charter uh, junior high charter school concepts going on today. They were trying to do that in the 80s with, with my class. And it didn't really resonate looking back. So basically what happened was it wasn't hard. Uh, it was easy, but I didn't either. I didn't. I didn't appreciate it. I, I didn't feel that it was valuable. That there was very little um, structure to the classes. This the second class that I was going to tell you about. I don't know what it was, but like what it was technically called, but. We were to go into the room and find all these college level novels and and biographies and stuff on on the bookshelf that they had carefully curated and selected 
and, and then read it. Okay. So I give them credit because they were recognizing that me and other kids like me, I mean, there were probably 10 to 14 other kids, I think. Me and other kids like me were way above everybody else in the school. And we needed more and different stimulation than everybody else uh, found challenging. So I, I give them credit for that, for, for trying something. But at the time, I didn't, I didn't have any care for their position at all. I mean, I didn't, I didn't even think about it. It was all about me. You know, what, what do I want? What feels good to me? What's going to work for me? And I remember I picked a book in that class by, I think his name is Robert Silverberg. It's an amazing book. The book is called The Gate of Worlds, and it changed my life. The, the class sucked. <laughs> If I'm being honest, my opinion at the time was that the class sucked because it was just me sitting there reading a book the whole time. But the book was amazing. It was about, it was the first book ever, if I'm not mistaken, I've looked this up, I'm pretty sure, it came out in the 1970s. It was the first book ever to have um, alternative history timelines. And it was about if the Black Plague had never happened, and Europeans hadn't died so much, and it hadn't caused a spark and a revolution of ideas to cause people to want to make their lives better and then sail and find America, etc. You know, it's well known that America was already mapped out and people hid their maps. Uh, different countries and principalities hid their maps at that time. That was like spy, spy craft. But that's for another time. And so because the Europeans didn't come over en masse uh, in the 1200s or whatever, 1300s, what ended up happening was the Aztec Empire ended up super thriving and controlled the whole South American and North American continent. The Aztec Empire for the Western Hemisphere became what Europe, I mean, what uh, England is for the world today. <clears throat> I mean, the world primarily speaks English. Yes, there's billions of people in China that speak Cantonese and Mandarin, whatever. And there's billions of, well, millions at least people in India and Pakistan that speak other languages. But for the most part, all of them also are taught English in school. And I find that fascinating because in school, we, we get to pick if we want to learn a foreign language or not. But we don't have to. And I think that's a tragedy. I think everybody should learn at least one other language. But then again, that's part of freedom. So I digress. Let me get back to where I was at. So Gate of Worlds. Yeah, it was all about the Aztecs ruled the Western Hemisphere and what caught and it's the 80s or something at the time 1980s and cars are basically golf carts because I don't know they didn't have that big mentality or something who knows it's not really covered in the book what what it was that that caused the, the intricacies of things were different. But the other thing that I remember about the book was they, they talked about this famous drink, Aztec cocoa, Aztec chocolate or whatever. And it was basically cocoa, you know, hot cocoa, with cinnamon and cayenne pepper in it. And I remember always thinking in 1986 when I was going to school there, I remember I was thinking, wow, I'm going to try that someday. And when I got older, about 10 years later, I, I, I did. One day it came back to me and I was like, you know what? I got to try that drink. And I went and bought some cinnamon and cayenne pepper. Just a little bit of cayenne. Don't want to put too much in it. Oh my goodness, Lordy, that was so good. So let's get back to why I called the talented and gifted dropout. So I was in talented and gifted for probably a month. And I saw a promise in it, but it, it I didn't value it enough to stay in it. It kind of seemed like, 
what's the point of this? And what am I missing that my other classmates are learning? You know, I don't want to be part of some stupid experiment. That's, I think that's <coughs> kind of how I felt about it. And so I just told my mom, you know, I've, I'm not really feeling this. I want to drop out. And so I dropped out of Talented and Gifted. Now, if I had it to do over with what I know today, I'd have a different perspective. I would have gone through it and 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 made notes about it. But see, I didn't even take make journals at that time. I, I've been journaling ever since uh, I, I came down with my chronic illness. And I mean, that's one thing you could say that came from my illness is it caused me to start taking notes about my life, AKA a journal. So I journal all the time now. Um, in fact, one of the things that I journal with is a tool that I just found that uses a, a, a language called Markdown. And I'll do some videos on Markdown and show you about that and a product called Typora and maybe some other products because eventually Typora won't be free and then they'll charge for it. And, uh, and that's great, but you know, a lot of people are going to need something that's free to get them by. So, so that's why I've called Talented and Gifted Dropout because I dropped out of Talented and Gifted program. I was still talented and gifted, but I was no longer in that program. And so what is the purpose of the book? So that's where the title comes from. What's the purpose of the book? Well, let me go ahead and end this video here, and we'll leave that as the subject for the next video. But I want to give you just a few more details about this series. So this is a spiritual memoir that tells about my childhood and how art and music saved me as a misunderstood gifted child. So I started by writing down everything I could remember. I'm reading this so that I get it perfect. Uh, everything I could remember until about ninth grade. When I looked at all the memories, 90% of them are bad memories of pain, abuse, victimhood, and how I was violated and taken advantage of by others, especially family members. Originally, I was okay with naming names and blaming the evil deed doers, but something changed in my in my something changed for me about a year ago. And after consulting with people I trust, I decided against that approach. Instead, I decided a better option would be one of the following. One, tell in detail what real people did to me but use fake names. Or two, Use the real names and roles like father, mother, teacher, brother, uncle, etc. of people in my life, but only when discussing good experiences and for bad experiences, no names, but vague roles. So family member instead of my mom or my cousin or whatever. And to focus on how I felt and my experiences rather than who did what rather than so-and-so did this to me when I was nine. Let's say, when I was nine, I had a, a traumatic experience that caused me to go inside and, and discover something about myself. You know, it'll be something more like that, that kind of perspective. And let me tell you, I'm breaking away from my reading here because I, I want to tell you that one of the books that inspired me to write my memoir was Stephen King's book on writing. If you haven't read that, I, I encourage anybody who loves memoirs, loves writing, loves horror, loves uh, uh, stories about thought processes and workflows um, to get that book. It's incredible. It's not like any other memoir. It's not necessarily, um, uh, what do you call it? It's not necessarily a contiguous timeline of events, but it's more like... Uh, a rough collection of vignettes that are roughly within a similar time frame, but not necessarily. And uh, and Stephen King's writing stands up even in his uh, even in his um, nonfiction. Okay, so back to what I was saying. So a big part of the delay. Now this is why I'm making these videos. Um, why am I making these videos? Well. Um, I kind of came to the conclusion that I wrote most of this book. I gave it a, a, a I want to say I wrote the book. So one of the pre preparatory um, steps that I took in writing this book, the very first thing after I wrote, you know, the title, 
was to sit and say, okay, what is what are the memories I can remember from my childhood? And part of it is this book wants to be multiple things. It wants to be a memories of my childhood documented for posterity, um, but it also wants to be and primarily needs to be photos uh, or, or scans of my art. The, this book is supposed to be a big book of of my sketches and things that I drew and painted and art that I did when I was a little kid um, so that people can see where I came from you know as a graphic designer today uh, how you know studies and my sketches and the just different things I did as a as a I'm gonna say impoverished but a a, a welfare kid <laughs> I guess is probably a good enough term a poor kid in the 80s um, just trying to make ends meet as far as you know what I was going to use for um, writing for scissors this kind of stuff and for instance I ended up have you ever done this I ended up not being able to have scissors because my mom wouldn't let me use them because I was too little so I got around that and cut pieces out um, to make puppets, uh, paper puppets and stuff, and cut shapes out using a ballpoint pen. I just ran over a line multiple times and it would get it wet, and then the force of the ball would rip into it, and it would give it sort of a easy perforation. And then I just do, 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 take it out, and I was doing that when I was, you know, between five and seven, and sometime around age eight, I got to use scissors, so I didn't have to do that anymore. But so there's an example of something that I remember art related from when I was a little kid. But anyway, the difficulties of the difficulties of being a talented kid and wanting to do so many creative things and not having the resources. That's something we'll discuss it in a future video also, I think. But for now, what I want to address is just simply some of the obstacles that have delayed the publication of this book and none of it's been the publisher's fault it's all been my fault and it's been a sort of i don't say writer's block because it really hasn't been oh i can't think of a concept but let me tell you what i wrote to explain it that, that might help me keep on track a little bit so I found it difficult to finish the book based on several factors. Some of the top ones being carving out enough time and dedicating myself to writing the book. Okay, this might actually be about the press, so I'm going to go ahead and answer this. Good morning, this is Eric. Hi, Ta Hi Tara. Can I... Can I have you hold one second? I was actually recording a video and I just need to pause it. <laughs> okay, one second. So I just got off the phone with Bioboa Press, speak of the devil as they say. <laughs> and uh, my representative called me and asked me when I was gonna have the book finished and try to sell me an upgrade. And she actually gave me some really good information. And I might share that with you in a future video, but for now, I'm going to go ahead and, and end this. I just wanted to uh, cap off with the, the finale of what I was trying to say before was I decided that uh, we'll use real names and roles and stuff, but we won't uh, we won't give enough information to convict people, let's, let's say, um, when we're talking about bad stuff that was done. Okay. So a big part of the d delay is also that, uh, you know, I'm a deliberator, deliberator uh, although I've been getting a lot better at taking decisive action in certain situations. Which brings me to why I created this series, simple, in one word, accountability. So I hope to, by committing to posting videos on a regular and frequent schedule in this series, to be able to finish my book by March 2021. So let's make a something that should be a fairly easy commitment. Let's say we'll post videos Wednesday. Yeah, we'll post videos Wednesday. No, 
Tuesday, Monday, Monday, Sunday, Tuesday. Okay, we'll post videos Tuesday sometime. Let's just say expect a video on Tuesday by the end of the day. All right, and I'm going to primarily be posting this on my YouTube channel. I don't know if I have a Rumble. I don't think I have this on Rumble yet. Uh, it may not go on Rumble. This may just stay on YouTube. Okay, so finally, I just want to say here's some topics that we're going to cover in this series. Uh, the ups and downs of writing a book, how to self-publish a book, how to self-publish a color picture book, uh, working with Balboa Press, the joys of completing book writing milestones, how to publish your book through a small publisher, formatting your manuscript for print, how to write and publish a spiritual book, and when I left out, um, life as a talented and gifted child. Well, thank you for joining me today, and I hope you like this video, and I hope you stay around and watch the future series and join us on Tuesdays. Um, your suggestions are appreciated. This is basically a new channel. It's, you know, it's been around for a couple of years, but hasn't really been super used uh, to post too many videos. But I'm trying something new here. We're going to work on consistency. And we're not going to work on video quality. The video is good enough. I don't have wind blowing, so the audio should be good enough, too. Um, we're not going to use any fancy transitions or graphic cards or anything, at least not right away. The goal is eventually, since I am a designer, to figure out, to learn all that stuff and, and get it incorporated. But for now, it's just about getting the information out, keeping me accountable. I hope some of you become fans and, and friends and help me to stay grounded in this project that I'm that I'm doing. Uh, okay, well thank you again and have a great day. Make sure to like, share, subscribe and if you can drop some money and, and donate and help me out, um, you know that would really help my work. Uh, there's a there's a you know PayPal. There's a PayPal link, not link, but there's a PayPal uh, email address that if you want to help me, you can put some money in, in, the, uh, in my PayPal donation. Okay, thank you and have a great day. Amen.